Thank you. Why are numbers beautiful? It's like asking, why is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony beautiful? If you don't see why, someone can't tell you. I know numbers are beautiful. If they aren't beautiful, nothing is. That's a quote from Paul Erdős, a mathematician of legendary eccentricity. And mathematicians will often tell you that math is beautiful. But Erdős says that if you don't see it, no one can tell you. But maybe I can show you. As a computer scientist, I create algorithms for solving large math problems, particular sparse matrices. Sparse matrices can be viewed as a graph, like on the top of the slide. A graph is a, connection, is a collection of objects or nodes of the graph, and then the relationships between them, like friends on Facebook. This graph on the top captures the relationships in the four equations down below. Now, I've heard it said that if you put an equation in a talk, it puts half the audience to sleep. So let's see, with four equations on the slide, I've got one sixteenth of you left, right? In this matrix, the first equation is the matrix, is the equation for the variable W. And W is connected to Y, but not X and Z. So in the graph, make W and Y friends with each other, connect them, but don't connect W and X. The second equation is the equation for x, and it's connected to y and z, and so on. The, the third equation, for example, is equation for y, and it's friends with everybody. Now, I can tell you that so far, it's not quite yet beautiful, but the graph is very useful and very important for, for understanding these equations. Here's one of the matrices from my, my collection. Some people collect baseball cards. I collect matrices. This matrix is the simulation of a helicopter. And here, the graph of the helicopter is drawn on top of the helicopter itself. So you have the relationships in the matrix drawn as a graph on the helicopter. Now, this particular matrix is easy to draw as a graph because the helicopter itself gives us instructions as to where the unknowns are to, to draw the graph. But not every matrix comes with instructions on how to draw it. So for that, I turn to my colleague, Dr. Yifan Hu, who has a method of force-directed graph visualization. And the idea here is you take the graph and you put electrical charges on the nodes so they repel each other. And the edges between them become like springs or rubber bands that pulls them together. And then you look for a low energy state. And that's typically a really good way of drawing a graph. So here's what happens if you take that helicopter matrix and forget that it's a helicopter but you let the physics rule take over. Now that's beautiful. It looks like some sort of sea creature. The color here reflects the strength of the energy in the, each of the springs, each of the edges. Now that's beautiful. Let me show you now some of the matrices from my collection. This is not an orange fishy. Uh, this is a matrix coming from, that I collected at, from AT&T. It's a frequency domain circuit simulation matrix of a VLSI chip. This is a social network. Network Here, the nodes are either a person or a web page. And there's an edge drawn from a person to a web page if that person likes that web page. This is a quantum chromodynamics problem, a very high dimensional problem. That's not a sphere. That, that's not a surface. Those are just layers of edges upon edges. Financial portfolio optimization. Here the goal is to balance your portfolio against all possible future outcomes. These little filaments are the different possible outcomes that your portfolio might take. These are matrix, matrices are, matrix images are scientifically useful, but they're also beautiful. So much so, they've caught the eye of the popular press. There was an article in fastcompany.com on my matrix collection entitled, Geeky Science Problems Double as Works of Art. Sparse matrices, a lot prettier than they sound. As a computer scientist who creates code, though, to solve these matrices, and that's one of the matrices in my collection on the, on the image there, I can tell you that not only is the math beautiful, and not only are the matrices beautiful, but the code I write to solve those equations is beautiful as well. But it's even harder to illustrate the beauty of code 
than it is the beauty of math or matrices. But here's a particular piece of my code. It's probably hiding and it's probably in your pocket because it comes pre-installed as the default math library in about half a billion smartphones. And this is really beautiful code. What's happening here is that you take the current pivotal clique and you find the set differences with the prior pivotal cliques with the current pivotal clique as part of the approximate degree update process of a heuristic permutation for finding an ordering for a symmetric positive definite matrix that is asymptotically, and I've put the rest of you to sleep, haven't I? <laughs> okay, fail. Right, am I stuck? Like Erdős said, where, I mean, I can see that this is beautiful, and there's no way I can tell you. So what do we do? And yet, software, beauty in software is so important. You hate it when your apps crash. When a piece of software, when a code is well-written, well-documented, when the logic is sharp and clear, when the algorithm is elegant and fast, a computer scientist would look at it and say, that's beautiful code. Don Knuth, one of the founders of the field of computer science, wrote a book series entitled The Art of Computer Programming. And in his preface, he wrote, the process of preparing programs for a digital computer is especially attractive, not only because it can be economically and scientifically rewarding, but also it can be an aesthetic experience, much like composing poetry or writing music. Now, Knuth knows what he's talking about here. Not only is he a computer scientist, but he's also a composer and a musician as well. So just like writing poetry and, and writing music, there's something intrinsically beautiful about code. But I've struggled for most of my professional career to come up with a way of illustrating this, this idea that code is beautiful. Then I got an email. Mark Robbins from a London design agency contacted me. He found my matrix images in my collection on the web. He was putting together the artwork for the London Electronics Arts Festival in 2013. And he asked me this question, can artistic images of music be created in a similar way as your matrix images? Mark. And I almost replied, no, Tim, <laughs> delete, go on with my day. Right? This is nuts. There's no music here. This is helicopters and oil reservoir simulation and quantum chronodynamics and computational fluid dynamics and all this nice scientific stuff. There's no music here. But I'm really glad that I didn't click and reply no. And I thought about it for a little bit. And 30 seconds later, it came to me. Music has structure. Matrices have structure. With Fourier transforms, I could extract the structure from the music. And with graph theory, I could connect the music to itself. And I could take that, those connections, those relationships, encode it in a matrix and draw it as a graph. And hopefully come up with an artistic image, entire image of an entire piece of music. So I replied to Mark instead. I said, OK, that sounds like a fun challenge. I'll give that a try. So I spent about a week on it, writing the math mathematical code that embodies this idea. And a week later, I sent Mark an image, which he used for the artwork for the London Electronics Arts Festival in 2013. And it appeared on billboards all over London. That's a sparse matrix drawn as a graph on the billboards of London in, as an encoding of music. So I took this idea then, and I began to explore other kinds of music to see what they would, what kind of artistic images I could come out, come out from them. This is a movement of Also Sprach Zarathustra, also known as the theme song to 2001, A Space Odyssey. What you're seeing here is the entire movement. And the color comes from the piano keyboard, the frequencies. What I've done is I've taken the piano keyboard and painted all the keys. Well, not literally, I mean, but I mean computationally, right? So I've got orange and red as the high frequencies green and yellow in the middle, and then blue at the low end. So what's happening here in this music, you've got the low blue bass coming in, in the deep blue, and then you've got the three high crescendos, and it fades off into the deep blue again. Here's one of the crescendos.
in this image, the edges of the graph are the notes that I've extracted from the music, and the nodes of the graph are, is time. So that I'm connecting time to itself from notes found that I extract from the music using the Fourier transforms. Different kinds of music leads to very different kinds of graphs. Here is a jazz piece. It's a blue mesh. Now it's blue because it's got a lot of bass beat in it, a lot of low notes. And it's a mesh because That rhythm creates like a crystal. The rules repeat, and you, I get this blue mesh. Now, you might think, hey, well, this is mathematical art. It's going to be cold and sterile. It isn't, because the input to this process is organic. It's the human voice. So I get this very organic feeling that I'm extracting out of the singer and putting into visual art. It's very similar to this piece called, ironically, Blue Monday, and I get a blue mesh for Blue Monday, by the group New Order, which took part in, this is a picture from the London Electronics Arts Festival in 2013 that I had the privilege of attending, and above their heads, I've put my artistic rendering of their music. Now, their music, I'll play for you shortly, has a very complex rhythm. It's like a mesh within a mesh. And I get, I'm sorry, it's a rhythm inside a rhythm. And I get a mesh inside of a mesh. Don't worry, I'm not going to dance up here. <laughs> I'm tempted. Oh, this piece is a piece by Don Knuth, the, compose, the uh, computer scientist and composer that I quoted earlier. This is an organ piece. And what he did is he took the entire book of Revelation verse by verse, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and translate it using an algorithm and constraint-based process, algorithmic and constraint-based process, into organ music. This is my artistic rendering of his chapter six. Now, there's no deep blue meshes in this, because there's no heavy bass beat, there's just a, there, but there's a lot of beautiful complexity and all the different notes that come out of that organ piece. It's beautiful, it's complex, it's nowhere near as complex as Bach. This piece is Cut Trance by Kevin MacLeod. And as you can tell from the blue mesh, if you follow along, that this is going to have a heavy rhythm. But when I came up with this image, I was stunned, very unexpectedly. There, look at those cells. This is not a simple mesh. There's a 14-way cycle there. And that 14-way cycle repeats. The music has a 14-way rhythm to it. When I drew this image, when I constructed this image, I thought, oh, I really got to find out what parts of the music is constructing, creating, what part of this graph. Now, recall, when I, as I described it, it, every edge in this graph that I create is a note that appears in the music at a particular point in time. So once I have the image, I can then go and paint the image in time to create a music video. And you can see that pulsing beat create that, that image. In my journey of combining art and music and math together, I've come across other artists and composers who embody a similar principle of combining seemingly dis disconnected, different, totally different domains together to create their art. And what I've done in my mathematical software is added another layer of complexity by translating their music into visual art. 
This next piece is an avant-garde orchestral composition by Yanis Zanakis. He was an artist, a composer, a engineer, an architect, and a mathematician all rolled together. And what he would do in this particular piece and others, he would draw his music in space and then create mathematical rules that translated that spatial design into music from vision to rules to works of art. And then he envisioned an inverse path where you take his works of art, his music, through mathematical rules to vision. Well, that's exactly what I've done. In a way, I've put his music back from where it came from, the spatial domain, and that's my artistic rendering of his uh, music above. <laughs> TV song by Blue Man Groove. Now, I said I wasn't going to dance, but what I see, this is like a, like a Rorschach inkblot test. I don't know what you see in this image, but I see a dancer, maybe with a funky red headdress and a, a trumpet held to his mouth some big thing strapped to his waist. That's pretty crazy, because if you know Blue Man Group, that's what they actually do. <laughs> they, they build these funky instruments and strap them to their bodies and walk around on stage to create their music. Matt Goldman, Blue Man Group co-founder, writes, in Blue Man Group, there is no separating science from technology, from math, from engineering. A past Blue Man performance went as far as describing the phenomenon of synesthesia, hearing colors, or seeing sound. Seeing sound with art and science and math. So consider our journey together this evening. Math is beautiful. Matrices are beautiful. Mathematical software is beautiful. Triggered by a seemingly random email from a guy in London, I came across a way of showing to you the idea that mathematical software is beautiful. Who would have thought it, that mathematical software is beautiful? My question is, what do you do that has a hidden, that is beautiful, or that has a hidden beauty? My challenge is, just like that random email from London that I got, keep an eye open for the unexpected gradient, seemingly disconnected different aspects of your life that collide together to produce unexpected, serendipitous beauty. Thank you. <laughs>